back to another edition of Components Breakdown. Today we're going to look at a game that was released at the tail end of 2010 called The Great Fire of London 1666. The Great Fire of London 1666 is a 3 to 6 player medium light strategy game that takes about 90 minutes to complete. Now, it's based on the historical fire that took place in 1666 in downtown London, in which a very careless baker forgot to put out his fire and destroyed nearly 13,000 homes in downtown London, leaving about seven-eighths of the entire city's population homeless. Now, in this game, each of the players is going to take on the role of a wealthy landowner trying to save as many of his houses in the district as possible, while also taking on the dual role of trying to put out as many fires as he can. So, let's go ahead and open up the box and take a look at what comes inside. Now we fully set up a six player game and the best way to introduce all the game's components are by showing you how the game sets up because we'll touch on each of these briefly as we move through this portion of the video. What you have in front of you are called the fire stack cards. The fire stack cards designate the different rounds in which the fire intensifies stage takes place. Now the number of these fire stack cards that you will use in the game is completely dependent upon the number of players participating. Since we are playing with six players, you're going to use all six of these lettered A through F. Now these are called the fire movement cards and these will be seated into the fire stack cards. They come in four different varieties. There is north, east, west, and south, designating where the fire will move when it takes its last movement on that specific player's turn. Let's show you how to combine the two into one deck. Now we come back to the fire stack cards and we look on the table and see how many players will be participating in this game. We notice with a six player game we'll be using this designation of cards to go on top of it. So we will randomly pick four of the fire movement cards and place them face down on top of this. Let's show you what that looks like. Again we have letter A face up with four randomized fire movement cards face down on top of it. They are shuffled as such and simply placed like that. Then the next thing we will do is we will take number B and put five cards for a six player game randomized face down on top of this one. And we'll keep moving forward until the deck has completely been assembled. Once your deck has been completely assembled, just leaping through it, you're going to see the F, followed by the E, the D, the C, and then the B. And there you have your deck fully set up. With the remaining cards, five will be dealt out to each player, face down for the fire movement cards, and the rest will be discarded without anybody looking back into the game box. Once you place the game board in the center of the table, you're going to notice a few very distinct regions. On the bottom of the board, running west to east is the Thames River. Now, it serves no gameplay purposes, but it does serve as a visual identifier for all the movement cards and get you better acquainted on which way the fires will move from round to round. Also on the board are five very distinct housing regions or districts. Four of these housing regions will be used to place houses and move the fire throughout the city. The fifth and final region is actual Pudding Lane itself, and this is where the fire originates at the start of the game, and where new fire cubes will usually, or fire cones, will initially be placed. There are six different colored of houses that are provided in the game. Now, each of these different colored homes are going to represent a different player that is participating in the game, and he will be trying to save those homes from being destroyed by the fire. There are 20 total homes of each player's color. Looking at the game board, as I previously mentioned, there's four districts in the game, or regions, and within each of those regions, there's multiple districts. On each of these districts, they will have a name of that specific district, as well as a symbol for the number of houses that will be placed on that district at the start of the game. Now, when the game first begins, you're going to take five houses from each of the six different colors, you're going to randomly mix them in the red provided bag that comes with the game, and you're going to blindly draw them and place them on one region at a time. Now, you're going to make sure that districts are going to have enough homes on each of those di specific districts to match the number of symbols that are on them. They come in lots of one, two, three, 
four, and a maximum of five possible homes. Once one region is done, you're going to mix in another five from each caller and keep doing that until all the regions and all their districts are filled with the homes. Now again, this is randomly done, so each time you play, your colored homes are going to be in different districts throughout the map. 25 red fire cones will then be placed in the district of Pudding Lane, designating the origin of the fire. There are 20 black round tokens that are provided in the game representing victory points, the ability to move a fire twice in one turn, and explosives. And these are simply placed face down next to the board and shuffled and then distributed in all of the different districts whose names are colored yellow on the board. Players will then shuffle the three green decks that are marked with Roman numerals 1, 2, and 3, and they'll shuffle them separately of one another. Each player will then draw one objective from each of the three stacks. Now these denote different things or different districts that players will need to save in order to earn points at the end of the game. This is but one example of one of the objectives that is included in the game. This is a level 1 objective noted by the back Roman numeral. It is one of the easier ones to acquire for the simple fact that it is further away from the origin of the fire being Pudding Lane. And there's a small dot showing you how far or where on the map it is initially located. This is their artillery grounds and is worth 2 victory points, with the level 3 objectives worth 6 victory points. Players will then be randomly drawing from a stack of six cards to determine which of the six different colored player houses they will be protecting during the game. It is also during this time that a starting player will be designated. There are six black train bands that represent the men and women of London who fought and contained several of the fires during its outbreak. Beginning with the starting player, each player will take one of these black train bands and place them on any of the districts on the board. Now there is one rule that governs the placement. They have to be placed outside the green region which contains Pudding Lane, can be, but can be placed in any of the other three regions. Now these black train bands are integral to winning the game, containing fires, protecting your districts, and putting out additional fires with the help of your own homeowner pawn. Each player will also have a color-coordinated homeowner pawn, which represents his landowner through the course of the game. Again, starting with the beginning player, each player will place their homeowner pawn on any one of the districts he so chooses, again abiding by the rule that they cannot be placed in the green district that contains Pudding Lane. These homeowner pawns will be used in conjunction with the train bands to control, contain, and eventually put out fires, earning players victory points. The player's turn consists of three very specific phases, which will have to happen in this order. The first phase is called expanding the fire, and it is during this turn that a player will play one of the five fire movement cards from his hand to direct the fire spread throughout the city. Now there are some simple rules that govern the way in which a fire spreads from one turn to the next. The first rule simply states that a fire can only spread from a space which has at least two fire cones in it originally. Now at the start of the game, Pudding Lane is the only district to meet that criteria since it has 25 fire cones in it originally. Now as the game progresses though, players options will obviously open up, so they'll have the ability to move fire from districts that aren't Pudding Lane. But they'll always have to be cognizant of this rule, and again, the rule states that a player can only move a fire if it has at least two fire cones in it originally. Very important. Now the second rule states that a fire can move through as many connected districts as you desire in any direction despite which card that you should happen to play on that turn. Now this can be tricky to understand because if you're going to play a west card, doesn't that mean the fire has to spread west? No, that's not exactly what it means. As the fire spreads and makes chains that lead back to Pudding Lane, players can use these chains to move fires through. Now, the rule that they will have to obey in moving these fires through them is rule number three. And that simply states that the last movement of the fire through the city must be in the direction of your fire movement card. So let's give you a couple brief examples of how this works. Example number one is going to be very easy to understand. We're going to look at the starting player's move. Say, for instance, he plays a West Fire Movement card, allowing to take one of the fire cones from Pudding Lane and move it into one of the three possible districts west of Pudding Lane. Very easy to understand. Say, he, for instance, he just takes this one and places it here in Voyner's Hall, destroying all the houses inside of there. His turn would be up. Let's show you example number two. 
Example number two here is going to show you how the game will then open up once one player has moved a fire out of putting lane. On the second player's turn, he would play the North Fire card. Now, he has a lot more options available to him. There are five options of moving the fire north, being one, two, three, four, or five. Any one of those, he can take something from putting lane. However, he can also use the fire that had previously spread, moving it west first, and then his last movement would be north, putting it into a place that he previously could not get into, and destroying the house, of course, that was there. That's how fire will travel through the game. It originated where a fire had at least two fires, moved through a fire in any direction that he wanted, but ended the turn in a direction that coincided with his fire movement card. Now there are a couple rules that govern the way in which a fire will spread from one turn to the next. And they're called the fire movement priorities, and I'm not going to go into them in a whole lot of detail here, but the overall design behind this rule is the fact that fires will always want to spread into districts which contain unprotected houses. They're always wanting to burn down new houses. They're wanting to stay away from either burnt down regions, districts, and any place that have train bands inside them. It's actually very easy to understand the logic behind these rules, and it makes really good thematic sense in the game. Now, as I just had shown you, when a fire moves into a new district, they destroy all the homes in them, whether it be one or five homes. Everything there gets burnt down, and they're removed from the district and placed on the fire damage score track. Every house that a player loses, loses them two points in the game. The other two rules that need to be noted about moving the fires are these. First, if a fire should ever happen to move into one of the districts that contains one of the black train bands inside of them, that train band would then be placed over top of the fire, simply stating that the fire is at that point contained. Now, it's very important to understand this rule because new fires will never be able to pass through them. They will simply go into that location and stop unless there are more uncontained fires in them, and then which fires can then move through them. It's kind of complicated at first, but it's actually very easy to understand. Now, if a player should happen to move a fire into one of the districts containing any of those small round black markers, they would actually pick that up and place it on their side to be used at a later time or for victory points at the end of the game. Phase 2 of the game is called Taking Actions, and it is in this phase that players may take up to four total actions in any combination that they so choose. Now, the actions that are available to the players are these. They can move their landowner pawn one space per action point through the districts as they see fit. They can also move any unoccupied train band one space per action point. And finally, if valid, they can put out a fire for one action point. Now, putting out a fire is actually very simple to understand. If a district contains both the player's lane under pawn and a number of train bands that meets or exceeds the number of fires in that district, that player can use one action point to put out the fire. Now, when a fire is put out, the player simply takes that fire and places it in front of his play area, and it will give him one victory point at the end of the game for each fire that he's extinguished. Players can also, during their action phase, utilize the demolition charges they've acquired to completely destroy a district, blocking the fire or the movement of fire through that district for the rest of the game, which can be completely invaluable in protecting a lot of your objectives on the game board. The last phase of the game is called drawing a new fire card. And there's a couple things that will happen here. First, the active player will replenish his hand by drawing back up to five total fire movement cards. Now, very important, if they draw a card and reveal that the next card is the fire stat card that we previously showed you how to set up, then that player will take a quick phase called intensifying the fire. Now, to intensify the fire, the player simply takes three fire cones from the box, because there's a lot more than the 25 that are simply placed in putting lane, and he'll be able to place them on any uncontained district that currently has fire inside of it. So it kind of intensifies a fire that's further down the chain that originated from putting lane. And the game will continue on as such until the final A fire stat card is revealed, of which each player will then have one final round, and then a winner will be determined. Now, victory points in the game are scored for five very specific categories, including the points for the highest point value not covered by his own houses on the fire track. He gets one victory point for each fire that he has extinguished and is placed in front of him. He gets one victory point each for each of the round black tokens that he has collected. 
he gets two victory points if he is the hero of London. And basically the hero of London signifies that he has put out the most fires in the game. And the last thing is they get victory points or players get victory points for any of the three districts that they may have uh, protected or have survived in accordance to the objective cards that he received at the beginning of the game. So what is my overall opinion about the Great Fire of London 1666? Now it's very obvious after playing it several times that it is most definitely a gateway game and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a very easy game to play, very easy to teach, very easy to learn, not a whole lot of deep strategy going on. You're basically moving a fire, moving your people to protect your areas, drawing up a new card and waiting for your turn to come back around. Now it's very odd that I should review two games back to back to have the same similar feeling that I get from them, not thematically and definitely not mechanically, but I reviewed Minds of Zavendor last week and it was a game that just did not play well with two players. Uh, I get the same feeling from this game. I've played it both three, four, and six players, and I can tell you that the more players that are interjected into the Great Fire of London, the better the game experience. And the reason why that exists in this game, as well as the Minds of Zavendor, is that you have a lot less time um, in this game to kind of coordinate your turn from round to round. When you interject three more players into the game, you have your turn, then you have to wait five more turns before it comes back to you and that's a huge disadvantage to everybody a lot less control a lot more spreading of the fire and it just feels naturally better and more thematic with the game so if you have larger game groups that have four five and six players that regularly play with you I would definitely suggest this game if you're looking at a smaller amount of players three players I would probably only suggest it to get your feet wet and understand the basic gameplay mechanics but it's not really as interactive as I would have liked to um, to it to have been. Now, that being said, it, it's mechanically well sound. There's a lot of cool things going on in the game. The game board for a lot of people was too busy. Not the prettiest game board in the world, but it's, it's colorful, it, it's okay to look at, and it's functional, and that's the biggest thing and what people should be looking toward. So, if you like this style of game, if you like easy, more relaxing strategy games, I would definitely give The Great Fire of London 1666 a look. That is The Great Fire of London, and I am Jeremy Salinas, and thank you very much for watching.